Welcome. And uh, we've got a great panel uh, today. We're going to hear some, some, some cool stuff. And um, uh, we're going to clear the tank here. Uh, we'll bring him in. Uh, he's meeting with the, uh, the chancellor right now. Or with the provost. 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 That's right. He's meeting with the provost. So please get sure we'll bring him in. Um, so we'll, we'll do some introductions here, and not very long, because I want to hear from them. But uh, we've got on the stand uh, a friend of Gary Allen. Allen. Gary, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. Gary is the VP for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer for the system. And uh, uh, what else can I say? Gary, you're, you, you lead the, the charge and uh, make sure that we get the right people involved in that. So we're glad that you're here. Uh, relation to technology services, the higher education, K through 12 stations, library, the state government. Right? So that's, that's scary. We've got uh, Greg Smith, good friend, golf buddy. Uh, on the stand here also, uh, Greg is an interesting character. He's been around in a lot of different things. Most recently at the Morgan State, they played Utah this weekend, so we're going to be watching that game. It's here at Morgan State. But uh, uh, Greg is the uh, uh, Chief Information Officer here on campus, and uh, he has a lot of names under him. So whenever I need something, I call Greg, and he tells me the right person to talk to. So we're glad to have Greg. Greg actually uh, has a chemistry degree and has worked in the oil shell and oil sands industry as a mining engineer and, and mining. So he loves fireworks, too. <laughs> 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 um, and again, you've heard uh, uh, Henry Boyer Hanks' introduction this morning in the Chancellor. Uh, and again, I've um, known Hank for a number of years as a chemical engineer through AICHE and, and reaction engineering. And we like reactions with chemical engineers. And so uh, Hank actually was the founder of one of the sections in AICHE in reaction engineering. So just a, it's a cool, cool background that he has. And we're glad to have him here in our team. Um, and then Mark. Mark Forkow is the guy that gets it all done. He's the fixer, as Greg said. He makes make sure that if you have a problem, he gets the right people involved. And so if you have any questions, Mark's the guy. And I know Mark actually, uh, my interaction with Mark a lot different way, most recently with Arkansas. And going to Arkansas and seeing what opportunities for collaboration between campuses. And so that was kind of a nice, a nice thing that we were working on right now, trying to push forward. So, with that, I'm going to let, uh, uh, let's see, who wants to go first? Here. Gary, you're going to go first. I've been waiting to go Hankins here. So we can go in the other way. We Mark, to Greg, to me, to Hankins. Okay. 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 There we go. Okay. Mark, you're up first. Uh, okay, so I assume that what I'm supposed to do is say what I do on a daily basis. And uh, so philosophically, the Chancellor mentioned this morning, our team's function is to help our researchers go farther, faster. And that means that we take on a function, uh, a mission, to be technology experts. So faculty members are encouraged to bring us problems, and we don't care what they are. Uh, if there is a technology solution that applies, uh, we try to ferret it out, determine whether we can fund it, uh, what the cost, how we would implement it, and so on more collaboratively with the faculty to, to produce um, the tools they need uh, for going for research. And I see Richard Dawes is in the audience. He's kind of our shining star uh, in where he uses the cluster for his work, but we run the cluster for him, allowing him to spend his time working on Malpro. And uh, so hopefully we'll make him go faster because you know he's going to pay more salary someday. But, uh, but so that's our function. We also spend a lot of time providing experience to learning to students. Um, I have students that are engaged uh, pretty much every hour of their work time on developing their own skill sets and problem solving. The life science are out through a building that you're seeing. Uh, that was, the software was developed by one of my students. Uh, there are other projects we have, the so visualization systems that's being developed by the students as well. But the, the approach we we're taking is to generate the next um, generation of experiential engineers. So they get their formal training from our qualified faculty, and I put tools in my hands and tell them to build stuff for me. And uh, it's a good combination so far. Um, that's on a daily basis, that's what I do. And also at the odd conference every year. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, 
I'm Greg Smith. Uh, I'm the CIO. Uh, typically, you look at the CIO as responsible for IT and higher education. That's pretty defined. But uh, really, what brought me to SMT was uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, also have a, a part in uh, research, and especially I kind of gravitate towards the STEM discipline. So that was extra benefit. Uh, but it's an interesting uh, that role. Um, You've got a lot of needs on a campus, and mostly it's about keep my computer running. Um, my classes have to run in, in, you know, in these labs, and, uh, it, and and of course keep the administrative uh, processes running so we can do the business of, of the university. But um, research support is a little different animal, and um, I, I was uh, remembering back in my days at the Purdue School of Engineering Technology at IUPUI. Um, we, we only had engineers, and, and uh, I had a lot of trouble because I didn't have a research support team and I couldn't get my traditional IT people to bend the rules, so to speak. And that's really that's really what it comes down to is we can't, you know, researchers don't want to be told no. Um, they want to be told how do I, how can we make this work? And traditional IT, it's about policies and rules. So, you know, I, that's my role. I, I, I create the uh, connection of the flexibility of research support team and then the connection to my IT policy folks that provide all those resources. And if you can make that and they work together efficiently, then you can give, uh, you can really stimulate research. And I guess the, the other path that I wear is the, all those connections. Many times I'm playing the salesperson as far as interacting with the faculty to find out, well, how could we help you? And, and then it really comes down to you need to trust us. I mean, we're just IT. We really don't want any of your business. We just want to make you more successful. But surprisingly, that's not always the way IT is viewed. Uh, you know, sometimes we are that, 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 that empire that they fear. Um, so um, anyways, that's, uh, that's a CIO's role at, a, at an institution like this. Okay, um, so I'm going to speak to, uh, to the University of Missouri system level. I'm also a CIO of campus, I'm the CIO of Columbia. So I have the same kinds of challenges that Greg has here as a key in terms of trying to provide a campus specific infrastructure for the research on a Columbia campus. But speaking specifically about the system role, so uh, my job is to try to find ways to build connections among the campuses to leverage the collective uh, expertise and investments that the campuses have towards the greater good of all. So we do that in a couple of ways. I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them. One is we have an intercampus backbone, fiber optic backbone that's <coughs> inside the state of Missouri that enables us to have very high data transfer rates between the campuses. We can use it for backing up administrative systems. We can use it for access remotely to uh, specialty equipment or instrumentation or HPC. Um, we are supported in that network by a, a branch, an actual branch of the University of Missouri system called MORNET. Uh, in addition to supporting the backbone that we all run over, they provide connectivity to more than 500 K-12 school districts, plus all the public libraries in the state and most of the higher eds. So they are the nervous system of the state, if you will, they connect us with, with not only each other, but with most of our constituents uh, in those categories that I mentioned. We are connected to the larger network uh, in the U.S. at Kansas City uh, through the GPN network, and they're represented here and sponsors of this event. Uh, we have a special relationship with GPN. They provide connectivity to Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, Missouri, and uh, also provides some backhaul for, uh, for Iowa and, and Minnesota. But what a lot of people don't know is that Mordet, the Missouri guys, actually are running the knock for GPN in Kansas City. So we actually are supporting the regional effort of, of uh, regional RD networks across the entire uh, seven states in the middle of the country. One of the biggest drainage points into Internet 2 uh, in, the, in the U.S. Uh, the system subsidizes each of the campuses' connectivity to Internet 2 and uh, helps provision that uh, to keep some of those expenses away from the campus level. Uh, and then what I'm doing in terms of philosophy, the 
Greg and I and the CIO from St. Louis and from Kansas City are actively working all the time to try to reduce the amount of spend that we are investing in administrative costs. The business are doing the business of higher education. So we're talking about things like ugly things like PubaSoft. How can we squeeze expense out of those investments so that we can redirect those funds to what's really important, which is instruction, research, and increasingly it's going to be technology enabled research because that's what's going to be required over the competitive. So uh, I, I just recently completed developing a cyber infrastructure plan for the Columbia campus. I would like to invite you all to come up there on the 10th of October and discuss that with us. We're going to have some breakout sessions. The themes of those kinds of discussions are going to be about uh, the benefits, both the financial and uh, efficiency in terms of research, the benefits of sharing. We need to change the economic model that's been used in a lot of the ways that we've invested in research technology. We've always taken it on kind of as the independent investigator. We need to think a little bit longer into the future and understand how our collective investments can move that whole ship much further than just worrying about the span of time across a single project. A really good example, and I'll put with this one, uh, a group of about 13 research institutions across the country have recently embarked on something called the Condo of Condos. They're all taking the investments that they're making at their local campuses. This is, this is Harvard, Stanford, Michigan, and the likes of them. They're taking the investments at their local campuses to strengthen those parts of the IT infrastructure that are really critical for their local strengths, their research strengths. So you'll have various flavors of HPC or visualization or high performance networking or whatever. They contribute a portion of that investment to the greater good of the other 12 institutions that are in the consortium. Now, the technology is neat. Having that hardware available is really neat. If you're on a fast network, that can look local to you and you can get your job done. But what's really critical is that they're, they're, they're uh, volunteering their expertise. So the, the, the minimal entry point for playing in this game is if you hire a staff member who's got expertise in a particular area, and you contribute that expertise to a greater good. So you share not just the hardware, you share the brain, the wetware, that allows that hardware to bring some benefits to your research. I think we have a huge opportunity to do exactly those kinds of things, both within the university and the system, but across the region. And it's actually going to be critical in my view that we do that if we expect to become something other than part of the country. Okay. My turn. Uh, okay. Uh, several things. First of all, I'm really impressed with the work, and I'm really impressed by the fact that it links together the uh, schools that we talked about this morning, but also ties together the high schools and the public libraries. Uh, I would like to tie this together with my discussion this morning in the following way. That is, uh, I have to think that quite a bit of what I'm talking about, the education of entrepreneurs, we can start to push out through morning and then through Great Plains Network to people who aren't even in our universities. And uh, we should do this as a public service. And uh, I think every, yeah. so now I'm taking a page from Michael Crow at Arizona State University. Uh, Mike's people have come up with something called the Alexandria Project. The Alexandria Project is so named because of the library in Alexandria. And in pushing content out to every public library in the state of Arizona, and they've asked each public library to set up a station, a place where they have content around entrepreneurship and they have connectivity. I think we could do it in Missouri. They told us to steal the idea and link to us, by the way. We'd like that to link to us. Well, I think we should create a network then that might extend through the seven state region, all the way down through New Mexico and Arizona, and that would be pretty cool. These are a lot of states that are, quote, part of the country, and, uh, and yet they're the heart of the backbone of the country, of this, of this nation. So that's something I think we can do, and so you can kind of see I've got a stack in mind, you know, starting at sort of the university level, finding out what we have, promulgating out at Kansas City, if that's the best content that we've got, get that started, so that anybody in our university system can take that minor. I don't know what the roadblocks will be, but it will be some. And then I'd like to be able to get that content out to the other nine campuses around the state 
schools that are not in the university reserve system but are paid for by taxpayers and then get people contributing in the future to that content. Then break it down and make it a little simpler so that we could get uh, high school teachers. So high school teachers are talking about it, getting kids excited about entrepreneurship. And it's not about STEM. STEM's not enough. It's really about new business, growth of new business, and trying to convert things. You need STEM skills. But we talk about STEM all the time without a purpose. And I think this is where you tie it together with purpose. And then, as I said, as I learn more about GPM, the more excited about that. Because I think if we bring the states together, we can have national impact and we can get national funding for that which we're trying to do. So that's pretty exciting to me. And Gary has been really helpful. Getting to a place where I'm starting to really understand that, so thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, the next thing, uh, and, and so let me just top that off by saying I'm kind of thinking about this in the form of e learning around certain subject areas. If we do it for entrepreneurship, then I think, you know, we can do it for criminal justice as an example. We can do it for whatever you want it to be chemistry, physics, what have you. Uh, and I think we could free up time faculty members at places like this have more time to do research. Uh, if you're in the classroom all the time, uh, that's great. I love it. I'm proud of you. But at the same time, we've got to find ways to get you out of the classroom so we have time to explore these other things. All work in the place, not good for anybody. And the kind of play you do is important. So e-learning, I would say, from GEDs to PhDs. All right? That's kind of the idea. Everybody will do it for anyone. We won't be, you know, will be excellent. It's another thing I like about Michael. He defines excellence differently. Since he's not in the AU, and it's not likely to get in the AU, he doesn't care about the AU. But what he talks about is excellence in the 21st century is about what you produce in that student. So at the Ivy League schools, you take in a nicely cut diamond, and you polish it up and hold it out to make blemishes on it before it gets out the door. Here, at schools like ours, not raw, but other schools, we take uncut rocks and we convert them into diamonds, right? That's excellence. It's not about what you do when you came in and how little we added to you, but how little we did before you came in and how much we added to you. I'm making myself clear. Uh, the next thing is cybersecurity, and I haven't heard too much talk about here in Missouri yet. It's all we were obsessed with. It. Part of the reason we were obsessed with the past day is we had anywhere from 150 million dollars of DOT research every year. We were an AD more, and we did a lot of work for the three other agencies. So I don't know where that fits in and how to pack that together with everything else, but as we go forward and as we seek to do more and more of these things, the danger goes up, the risk goes up, and, and we have to figure out the cybersecurity piece continuously. At the same time, I like the way it's done here because you can log on anywhere. You know, if you're a visitor, you don't need special passes. It's amazing. It's a very different world for me, Missouri, than at Penn State because of that. Remember, we had 27 campuses around the state, and we said we were one university geographically distributed in the system. But we had that problem across the made it very hard for us when we wanted to do something like the Great Plains Network because our firewalls were so high, and it made it really hard to play nice on these sandboxes. Uh, unless it was the CIA and Ron Funny Nets that was special. And again, I'm being a little funny there, but it's not really what we want. So I kind of like it here. If there's a measure of approach, we're going to keep it right. The other thing, and uh, I think this is important too, is you know, we always talk about the stack at the team, and I'm going to sort of stack it differently and say, I think the stack now, from my perspective, is three, three major groups, right? Three major layers. The first layer is enterprise. I want to get my paycheck and I don't want it to be missed. You don't need it. I want me to get my benefits when I need them and I want it to be right. I want it to be easy and I want it to be hard. I want HR to time that so that we know where people are, what they do, and know who's tracking them. That's all enterprise stuff. That's a big, big piece of what we do because we're big operations. That cannot be minimized. It's hugely important. We have two other layers. We have the academic layer, which chases students around now, and should be telling them, hey, no, excuse me, you don't have the prerequisite for that course, don't sign up with it unless you get permission from your advisor. Or 
even though we've been watching you and this semester you're starting to fall off, you are not have the same academic advising, uh, longitudinal following of students, hugely important if we want to be sure that they get a good return on their investment. Now, we're far from the dates when big state universities used to say in engineering courses, look left, look right, by the end of the year, you know, the person next to you. It's not that long ago, right? That we used to do that. We did it with Brian. We were sifting. Right? Now we're supposed to be retained and, and try to get those kids who wouldn't have been there through the system so that they're coming out of the other end. It's a very different world. And in that different world, you really have to have in that stack that academic piece. And the expertise in, in enterprise, I don't think is the same expertise for the academic stack. Right? They're different kinds of people. And we need to recognize that, all enabled by technology. So then that leads to the last part of the stack, which is research. Now, everything that we do in research today is enabled by technology. So, Joe and I are old enough to remember when there were only two kinds of people in the world. There were theoreticians, not you, you two young, the guy who had <laughs> There were theoreticians and there were experimentalists, right? And that was it, that was the world. You either did things in the lab with experiments, or you worked with a pencil and paper and, and did trying to find analytical solutions to really tough problems. And the reason you wanted that is because you had a slide where you do your computing on what's going on this right? The great news was that most of industry that we see around us was built by people who lived in that world. Experimentalists and people with slide rolls and pencil and paper. Now we did another one. And the world is there's a third, and that's simulation. And 10 or 15 years ago when this first dawned on me, I wasn't too worried about those simulation folks. It was an hour slice, like a specialist. Now everybody's a simulationist. Now the scary part about that is everyone with a hammer is not a copper. We won't go into this, but we've got a lot of people doing simulations that have no business doing another story. But, but, that's where you want to have expertise of people who are both cyber engineers who really do know the difference and really can keep faculty members, students, and others out of hot water and really make what they do that much better. And that goes then all the way from compute, which is, you know, I still think of, you know, partial differential equations, difference equations. To me, that's computing when I think about computing. But that's not computing. That's just one end of the spectrum of computing. The other end of the spectrum is big data. I'm not sold yet on big data, that we can replace thinking with big data. But a lot of people think that's true, and I think we have to explore it and go forward. And everything we're doing. And that's pretty exciting. You also, I think, want to get to the place where, let's say Joe had some really fantastic model that's taken 10 years to build that couples reaction and diffusion, uh, not out so thermality, complex reactions, and memory reacting, right? You know, maybe you don't want to do that on an off-the-shelf CPU. Right? Maybe you actually want to burn that model into the hardware. Now, what is this called? I think it's computing. I can't remember what it's called. I think it's hybrid computing. The acceleration you can get if you go back to that old-fashioned idea of building a computer for the problem. So, remember, we, what we do now is we build computers and little bit software out of the problem. There's a whole other thing coming yet again, which is some hybridization of that idea. And we want to be able to do that. And I think we want to even be able to enable faculty members to go out with designs for chips like that and get it done. And that takes a lot of extra expertise that you just can't get along the way as your grad students to go figure out. Unless you're in physics. You know. For the rest of us, we're humans, you, you, know, you need more than that. So to me, the vision is sort of a three-level stack. Every piece is important, but the experts in each level are different. And we need to acknowledge that. We do not tend to do that. We would never have a high-resolution TEM being run by someone who is an expert in buildings, right, the physical plan. Right? Why would we do that in computer? It doesn't make sense. So think of computers now as research instruments, right? And that's what they're doing. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. We've got 10 minutes. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the floor for some questions because we've got a great audience, a great uh, panel here that you can ask all your you know, key questions you want to talk about. So, questions. I've got a couple here. 
you don't have any about that. I know you do. So, go ahead. I mean, one of the things that we found about the Columbia campus was, of course, a huge amount data is not typically in the research area. I mean, each of the numbers of points are, well, two of them are probably couple terabytes of um, we, have, uh, we have three now, so we'll do the full post of five terabytes a week out of that lab. So it's huge. And so we teamed about three and a half four years ago to find out an SUR grant because these are kind of horrible problems across the whole industry. And these are things where we're many universities in the entire life as a problem center on the same day management problems. And I got really enthused by the fact that SUR will trust us and trust us again to bring us into more. Uh, the coordinated national solution for these things. And that, I think, went pretty well. I mean, there, there are always have been, and I think I refer to this earlier really today as keynote. Um, when you start to look at that scale, people start to criticize the fact that you're not all fire all from industry. It seems to be crazy, because again, industry is addressing the national scale again. But we could, in fact, closely engage ourselves. Just any thoughts in terms of how we might. I mean, these problems in and of themselves are, are age changing. How to get more integrated into the exchanges. I like the idea of the coordinated uh, networks across uh, well, different Great Plains, South Plains, you know, our, our intersection in Kansas City, but I'm the wire with the internet too. It seems like those people also have a huge opportunity. So, uh, here. Um, the vendor that you're talking about, the vendor market is um, a tough place to work. Uh, they've had their own hard times in the recession. And if you can cut a good deal and find some sweet spot where you're, you're doing something that is a potential or near-term interest to them, you can get a good bargain on the deal. Uh, most of them are looking to make money. Or, uh, and you should expect that that's their primary motivation for any relationship they get into with us. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it we looked at to uh, look into and work at. It's just it's harder than a lot of people believe, at least over the last few years, has been my experience. So uh, it's true. We and I have more than one. Right. And it's the classic. Let me back down. We have some partners from IBM. <laughs> See, we should have done it with Cal. Anybody here from that? <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're not there. <laughs> yeah. So, I run a production shop and, and we have 300 plus users and we try to squeeze every cycle we can out of our equipment. But right now the funding model for the equipment is that it's provided by the community through the National Science Foundation and other external agencies. Now, um, we did and passed through the ARA wall and funding is is actually declining. So I guess the, my question here is, um, at least as far as IT infrastructure, at a very high level, the most expensive, the highest turnover stuff, the HPC stuff, uh, is, is there a funding model that involves having the university or the state system uh, pay for that? that really top layer, expensive, high turnover thing that enables so so many areas of basic research. Just out, I think that's okay. Um, that's one of the that's one of the ships that we're kind of drive. Um, as far as I know, we're very quickly, but at, at the moment, none of the four universities or campuses get any direct funding from the uh, FMA that comes back on grade. Most of the equipment that we currently have in production has been obtained by direct request to the grading agencies by people that are running the HPC or, or whatever on each of the campuses where it's common in a, in a way of a direct uh, award to a faculty member who has seen clear to share that or partner with the central IT shop to put together a community cluster or, or something that can be shared across the campus. Uh, I think one of the models that has to change is that the, it's, it's what I'm actively doing in Columbia is building the case to make this a priority investment because to do otherwise is uh, application of our responsibility uh, and it's a certainty that we'll fail as a research institution without an adequate investment 
And what is increasingly a tank indicated, this is just a research tool. We've got to have it, and the state hasn't provided it to us. Part of the reason we don't get it direct is because most of the money that is currently in place is, uh, is coming from the feds already by the way of the grant. We haven't gotten very much uh, state support at all for this kind of infrastructure. So we need to change that. We need to talk about it and make people understand why it's a critical need across the university. I just wish there was some area, but it's appropriate because I couldn't agree more. If we're going to stay at pace, MRIs are a joke. They're so small, they're so few and far between. Uh, you need to be looking at putting in a system like ours, $45 million at minimum a year of your own back in. That is what a thing is supposed to be for. Mm -hmm. So we kind of went through this at my old institution, made the argument, had the president convinced, put $15 million aside. We just bought, bought a um, $5 million HRTPM that's uh, double aberration directed, one of the only ones in the world. And the argument I made is, look, you want to stay at the cutting edge? These are investments. So it goes back to a psychology, which is people think about research instruments as an investment. And they think of computers as an expense. And they kept saying, no, computers are, and this is the argument, computers are now instruments, they're not an expense. And, and we're, you know, with every death and retirement of older uh, administrators, it will get better. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you mentioned that what's happened over time, right? Yeah, it, 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 as we've gone from experimental and theoreticians to now computational scientists, yeah. that has to be a change in the paradigm, right? As you said, we've got to have the instrument. It, it, it's true. It, it, what people are shocked, you guys know what I'm saying. You, you could go in and calculate Several physical properties of gases in this chemical engineering is not more accurate than you can make the measurement. Okay, that shocks people when you say that. Like, That's impossible. That can't be true. It is true. It is true. Right? And, and they talk to you like, right? They don't get it. Same thing with the accounting practice. As long as we talk about the problem is way too cute and grew up. Right. It's really a problem. We went from vats, time-shared machines, or those obnoxious systems, and we all were over and whatever. It was like dogs let out of the pound. We all bought our own desktops, and then the world just got better and better, and now we're to the next stage where, okay, we'll just go buy your desktop or yeah. something. It doesn't work that way. No, so that's uh, the, the advancement of the technology infrastructure for research and higher education has suffered dramatically because of the commoditization of technology in general. You know, people believe that it's sufficient to go to Best Buy and buy a terabyte of data out of the storage. We've got to be thinking at a higher level of abstraction about building the tools that are going to raise, raise the benefits to everybody. You can't do that on your own. You do that in partnership by co investment buy things that you alone could never afford. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, did it go ahead. Good. About 30 seconds and that's about it, so go ahead. But no, I just came from the National Institute of Research, Richard mm Charlotte -hmm. created the National Institute of Research, talking about, you know, the change now, which brings computation, scientific instrumentation in a closer line than ever before. You don't go buy a GPS standard on the internet, you buy a gap for a generalized platform. That's the direction in scientific computation is no minimum in final instrumentation in a very rapid way. And so within just a few years, we're going to see the lines between data and analysis and large scale data acquisition. <coughs> where it's, it, there's no question. I think one of the problems that we also face is that it's changing so quickly. And it has for so long that we just expect it. You know, and it's going to be a wall. You know, the problem is is we don't keep up with the latest and, and to have the best instrument to stay at the cutting edge, you have to stay at the front. <coughs> Alright. Do we take we take one we are supposed to be over where the text message then our guest speaker for lunch is on And he has a deadline, so we do need We're gonna close. Thank you so much for coming.